Hello, and welcome back to Dialogue Sunday Gospel Study. Today, this is January 24th, 2021, we have Professor Kiff Augustine with us, drawing from sections three to nine of the Doctrine and Covenants. This is our first Dialogue Sunday Gospel Study session of 2021. Welcome back. Our current plan for this year is to meet this way every second and fourth Sunday, that is twice a month. After today, our next session will be on February 14th with L. Ray Henriksen, drawing from Doctrine and Covenants 12 to 17 and the last part of the Joseph Smith history in the Pearl of Great Price. As long as schedules hold, which will be a question all year, as long as schedules hold, our coverage should parallel, that is the sections of the Doctrine and Covenants considered, should parallel the Come Follow Me program, possibly plus or minus one week. Um, unfortunately, we do not expect a return to normal schedules with in-person church meetings anytime soon. When that does start happening on a widespread basis, we will review our scheduling for this program. Uh, I am, for today, I am Chris Kimball, conducting on behalf of the Dialogue Foundation Board. Other board members, Michael Austin and Rebecca Deschweinitz, are also part of our group today. As Always, we are using the webinar format on Zoom and running a live stream on Facebook. We are recording this program and we'll post the recording as soon as it is available. For viewers on Zoom, there is a chat function by which you can comment, ask questions and propose answers. And we try to follow comments on Facebook as well and introduce questions and answers when appropriate. As always, we ask you to be courteous and thoughtful. The chat room and comments are all recorded. For our lesson today, I am pleased to introduce Kiff Augustine. Kiff is professor, um, is the Ivan Mitis Chair and Professor of Law at BYU Law School. She was the Associate Dean for Research and Academic Affairs from 2008 to 2013. She has twice been a Fulbright Scholar, first in Argentina and later in Beijing. Her scholarship focuses on intersections among citizenship, immigration, gender, and race. She takes law students to volunteer in an immigration detention center in Texas to provide frontline legal triage to vulnerable women and children fleeing violence in their home countries. She and her husband, Sterling Adams, are the parents of three grown children whose diverse life paths enrich their own. We're excited to have Kiff Augustine with us. As we do so, I repeat our regular qualifier. We invite speakers and teachers for their personal insights for their own voice. Uh, Kev Augustine does not speak today for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, nor for BYU, nor for the Dialogue Foundation. Our program will end, begin today with the music, uh, My Song is Love Unknown by the King's College Choir, and our opening prayer will be offered by William Bates. William graduated from BYU Law School in 2020. He works as chief legal counsel to Encircle, a nonprofit organization dedicated to bringing family and community together to support LBGTQ plus people, especially youth. He recently completed a stunning cross-stitch tableau of a dragon. Guiding spirit, as we gather together today, we ask that we may find respite from our day-to-day -day activities and gain further enlightenment along our chosen paths. At this time, we ask that as we meet today, we may let our minds dwell on the good in our lives. That this time we be one of peace and enlightenment. That we may see the divine in one another reaching to do better and respond in kind. And for this we pray, amen. Amen. I, am I now up on video? Good, thank you. Kif, it's all yours. Thank you. Um, I'm grateful today to, to be with you. I appreciate Chris and Rebecca and, 
and uh, Michael organizing these Dialogue uh, Sunday Gospel Study sessions. They've been a lifeline for me over this last year or so as we've um, been isolated and unable to participate in our regular in-person sorts of activities. I'm um, grateful to William and to Christina, both former students of mine, for agreeing to pray today. Um, I, my life has been so richly blessed by the paths that both William and Christina have taken in their, in their lives. I also want to acknowledge that I personally sit on, stand on, live on um, the ancestral lands of, of the Ute, of the Ute people. On Sunday, January 17th, 2021, Dr. Benjamin Park gave a virtual dialogue fireside entitled Mormonism's Many Modernisms, what the faith's alternative trajectories in the early 20th century tell us about the 21st. Ben said, it is the task of the historian, not only to show how we got here, but why we did not get there or some other point that might have appeared all too definite in the past. In his magnificent presentation, Ben described the process by which the Latter-day Saint Church Americanized and challenged the inevitability of the particular form that assimilation took as conservative, inward-looking, and dogmatic. Park offered two individuals, Amy Brown Lyman and Franklin S. Harris, as exemplars of alternative trajectories, potential assimilationist paths for the Latter-day Saint faith involving modernism, critical thinking, and progressive social welfare. Ben noted that the alternative trajectories that Lyman and Harris represented seemed to have a bright future before reaching a dead end. Amy Brown Lyman was a Brigham Young Academy teacher, acolyte of Jane Addams and her settlement house, member of the Utah State Legislature, member of the Relief Society General Board, and eventually president of the Relief Society between 1940 and 1945. Franklin S. Harris was president of Brigham Young University for nearly a quarter century from 1921 to 1945 and president of Utah State University for five more years after that. Ben identified J. Reuben Clark, his entry into the first presidency of the church in 1933 his singular and continuing influence on what we now know as the church educational system through his Aspen Grove speech of 1938 and his systemic enforced efforts to enforce a sexual orthodoxy of monogamy as a force that dead ended the seemingly bright future of a more modern ecumenical and collaborationist socially progressive LDS church trajectory, one that Lyman and Harris characterized. Along with others, J. Reuben Clark set the Latter-day Saint Church on the path that we have inherited, a path that in the here and now and with survivor bias may seem inevitable. In his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, first published in 1962, philosopher Thomas Kuhn argued against a view of science where development by accumulation of facts and theories necessarily meant seemingly inevitable forward progress. Rather, Kuhn distinguished between normal science and revolutionary science, the first characterized by conceptual continuity and problem solving, the second by anomalies that fundamentally disrupt research questions and reorient attention to new avenues. Revolutionary science is at its core generative, creating new realms of inquiry where none exist before. Kuhn described that disruption as a paradigm shift a shift grounded not only in scientific discovery, but also in the sorts of questions that culture and society allowed a scientist to ask. In essence, Kuhn argued that science, especially revolutionary science, depended as much on the sociocultural context in which it occurred as on the physical verifiable world. Any particular scientific discovery is neither inevitable nor necessarily forward progress. Science like religion is socially constructed. Revolutionary science creates alternative trajectories, possibilities outside the ken of normal science. For today's dialogue gospel discussion, I approach the Doctrine and Covenants generally 
and today's reading assignment of sections three through nine specifically with Ben Park's alternative trajectories fresh on my mind and resonating across decades with Thomas Kuhn's paradigm shifts and socially constructed science. I first read the structure of scientific revolutions as an 18 year old undergraduate at BYU in an honors colloquium, Shaping the Modern Mind, led by doctors Ted Lyon, Lynn England, and Joseph Mur Murphy. I also met my now husband Sterling in that colloquium, hiking back from Delicate Arch during a class field trip, but um, that's, a different, that's a different story. So I see the version of the Doctrine and Covenants available to us today as socially constructed and not inevitable in its form or content. I see what counts as revelation and translation two major themes in sections three through nine, also as socially constructed and contingent rather than as inerrant and infallible. Like J. Ruben Clark, I'm a lawyer trained on the East Coast. I teach at the law school that bears his name. I research citizenship and immigration in the US-Mexico borderlands during the time J. Ruben Clark was US ambassador to, to Mexico. I deeply admire J. Ruben Clark for the humility he showed in 1951 when David O. McKay demoted him from first counselor in the first presidency of the church to second and required him to read out his own name as second counselor for a sustaining vote in April General Conference. Despite my professional connections with J. Ruben Clark's legacy, however, by intellect, faith, and passion, I am much more aligned with the dead-ended alternative trajectories of Latter-day Saint practice that Ben Park identifies in Amy Brown Lyman and Franklin S. Harris. I venture to guess that a goodly portion of our differences, mine and J. Raymond Clark's, stem from gender, his being a man and my being a woman, in a church with a profoundly gendered theology and concomitantly gendered structure and practice. And yet I see in J. Raymond Clark's life little inevitability, many alternative trajectories, at least until 1931, when he accepted the surprising call to join the first presidency and actually did so in 1933. His call to the first presidency highlights the alternative trajectories of his life. He had not worked his way through the type of church administrative assignments such as bishop or state president that typify general authorities. He was not a member of the Quorum of the Twelve. He was not ordained as an apostle until he had served 18 months in the first presidency. For good chunks of his adult life, his heteropraxis, infrequent church attendance and geographical separation from his wife and children would have precluded his employment at the J. Reuben Clark Law School created by the church in 1973, precisely to honor him. He could not have gotten a job at Brigham Young University in the late 20th century. But earlier in that same century, he could be called to the first presidency. That is an alternative trajectory. Because I am the first to present a dialogue gospel topic lesson in 2021 and on the Doctrine and Covenants, I take the liberty of providing a quick overview of the Doctrine and Covenants itself before turning to the specific assignment of sections three through nine. And lest you think too radical my assertion that, revolution is, that revelation is socially constructed, and scriptural forms contingent rather than absolute. I rely entirely on the introduction printed in the current version of the Doctrine and Covenants, other information from the church website and the Joseph Smith Papers Project to support my argument. Oh, I need screen sharing. Michael, can you? Allow me to screen share. Now screen share. Okay. Use your power for good, never for evil. So in the introduction to the, um, to the Doctrine and Covenants, the church makes clear that each new edition of the Doctrine and Covenants has corrected past errors and added new information. It focuses particularly on the historical portions of the section headings, but as we do a quick overview of different editions of the book of, uh, of the Doctrine and Covenants, we'll see some of the really significant structural changes um, that, that take place. Also in the introduction, um, the, it states that the early members of the church uh, 
and Joseph Smith viewed the revelations as they did the church, as living, dynamic, and subject to refinement or subject to change. Okay. In the um, 1833 Book of Commandments, we, we see uh, the bringing together of the revelations in the first published in the first published form. Before that, it was largely in manuscript collections, and so this is the first organization uh, bringing the revelations together. But notice that it says, uh, I think this is really interesting in terms of how it presents the name of the church. It's a book of commandments for the government of the church of the Church of Christ. Then in um, in 1835, we get a new edition of the um, of what is now called the Doctrine and Covenants. And it is entitled Doctrine and Covenants of the Church of the Latter-day Saints. So it took out the Church of Christ there and put in the Church of Latter-day Saints. And it, it was specifically meant to correct errors, clarify wording, and recognize developments, recognize developments in terms of revelation. The 1844 version is not so different in terms of its um, of its layout, although now the title is Doctrine and Covenants of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I included some of the um, end pages here and the front cover because I just thought they were um, beautiful presentations of, of, the, of the book. In um, 1876, we have very major changes to the Doctrine and Covenants. Orson Pratt, under the Brigham Young's direction, uh, arranges the revelations chronologically and supplies new headings, but really significantly, they add 26 new, new sections. And then the 1921 version of the Doctrine and Covenants cut out entirely the doctrinal part, the lectures of faith, which are now um, just the lectures of faith. They're not part of our canonized scripture. There were changes in 1981 and changes also in, um, in 2013. So from my vantage point, growing up in the church in the 1970s and the 1980s, attending four years of early morning seminary, taking hours of required religion courses as an undergraduate at BYU, enough to constitute a minor at any other university and serving as a missionary in Mexico, the first vision grounded the restoration. The first vision was the origin story of the restoration, where and how and why it all began. Joseph Smith's reading of James 1, 5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. And his subsequent prayer provided the template for revelation. Following the admonition in the seminary film strip, film strip song, Like Unto Us, I understood the contemporary translation of Joseph Smith's ostensible question, which church should I join? To be for me and other Saturday's warriors, already members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, how should I live my life in harmony with God? In my experience, the first vision was the normal science of the 20th century church. Despite the revolutionary paradigm shift, it represented in the early 19th. I'm not personally troubled by multiple and varying accounts of the first vision, nor do I want to delve into the controversy and scholarship around them. With respect to the first vision, the doctrine and covenants itself and sections three through nine, my purpose is not to defend or even really to examine their truth claims or truth value, but instead to take a more anthropological approach and ask, what can they tell us about the social construction of Revelation and scripture? Although I'm not a historian like Ben Park or even an anthropologist, despite my anthropological take, I want to offer some ideas on the alternative trajectories of the past, that it was not inevitable that we got here and not there with respect to the doctrine and covenants. An anomaly that disrupts my perception of the first vision as the normal science of the 20th century church. Um, if the first vision begins the origin story of the restoration, why was it not included in the predecessor to the Doctrine and Covenants, 
that first compilation of scripture in the Book of Commandments published in 1833, or in the first edition of the Doctrine and Covenants itself published in 1835, or in the 1876 edition to which Orson Pratt under the direction of Brigham Young added those 26 new sections. I recognize that in asking these questions, I imply a hierarchy of value and authoritativeness between the Doctrine and Covenants and the Pearl of Great Price. I argue that the historical record supports that differential authoritativeness, at least for the 45 years between the Doctrine and Covenants canonization as scripture in 1835 and the church's official acceptance of the Pearl of Great Price as a standard work in General Conference in 1880. Franklin Richards, a member of the Quorum of the Twelve, then serving a mission in England, included the first vision in his 1851 missionary pamphlet entitled The Pearl of Great Price. The contents of Richard's 1851 pamphlet overlap some with the Doctrine and Covenants, but not with respect to the first vision. Thus, despite being one of the earliest, if not the earliest, of Joseph Smith's visions or revelations, the first vision was not canonized as Latter-day Saint scripture until 1880. In 1902, the church removed from the Pearl of Great Price content duplicated in the Doctrine and Covenants. Then in April 1976, the church added two items of revelation to the Pearl of Great Price, only to move them three years later from the Pearl of Great Price to the Doctrine and Covenants. They are now in the Doctrine and Covenants as sections 137 and 138, two visions of um, redemption of the dead, one from Joseph Smith in 1836 and the other Joseph F. Smith in 1918. The changing content of the Pearl of Great Price, especially excising content duplicated in the Doctrine and Covenants and moving content from the Pearl of Great Price to the Doctrine and Covenants as recently as the 1970s, demonstrates its contingency, the construction of scripture through human decision-making. Likewise, the removal of lectures of faith from the Doctrine and Covenants in 1921 does the same. But understanding that Franklin Richards included the first vision in the 1851 Pearl of Great Price and knowing that it remains there does not answer why the compilers of the 1833 Book of Commandments, the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants, or especially the 1876 edition of the Doctrine and Covenants did not include it there. Its absence from the 1833 Book of Commandments is particularly interesting given that the earliest known written account of the first vision and one of the few in Joseph Smith's own handwriting likely dates to the summer of 1832, shortly after Joseph Smith received the direction to bring together and publish his revelations in what became chapter one of the Book of Commandments and section one of the Doctrine and Covenants. The various written accounts of the first vision identify no specific date or month for its occurrence, but relate time to Joseph Smith's age including his preoccupation with spiritual matters from the age of 12 years to 15. Whatever the actual year of Joseph Smith's vision, whether as early as 1820 or as late as 1824, dissemination of the first vision in the early years of the church was relatively limited, especially in comparison with its circulation in the latter half of the 20th century. In his fall 1966 dialogue article, the significance of Joseph Smith's first vision in Mormon thought, James B. Allen argues, the fact that none of the available contemporary writings about Joseph Smith in the 1830s, none of the publications of the church in that decade, and no contemporary journal or correspondence yet discovered mentions the story of the first vision is convincing evidence that at best it received only limited circulation in those early days. More than a half century later, and even with the Joseph Smith Papers Project identifying, collecting, and making readily available contemporary writings about the first vision, perhaps unknown or inaccessible in 1966, James Allen's basic point remains valid. The first vision received only limited circulation in the earliest years of the Latter-day Saint tradition. In retrospect, that it would go on to form a dominant narrative for the 20th century church and the template for personal revelation taught to seminary youth and in turn by them as missionaries to prospective converts around the world could hardly have been inevitable. 
In 1854, Orson Pratt remembered how Joseph Smith's revelations circulated in the early days of the restoration. Chris, can you read that for us, please? Unmute there. We often had access to the manuscripts of the revelations when boarding with the prophet, and it was our delight to read them over and over again before they were printed. And so highly were they esteemed by us that we committed some to memory, and a few we copied for the purpose of reference in our absence on missions, and also to read them to the saints for their edification. These copies are still in our possession. Three years later, in 1857, in the Millennial Star, Orson Pratt described some of the choices Joseph Smith made, Joseph Smith and others made, regarding publishing his revelations. Joseph the prophet, in selecting the revelations from the manuscripts and arranging them for publication, did not arrange them according to the order of the date in which they were given. Neither did he think it necessary to publish them in all the Book of Doctrine and Covenants, but left them to be published more fully in his history. Hence, paragraphs taken from the revelations of a later date are, in a few instances, incorporated with those of an earlier date. Indeed, at the time of compilation, the prophet was inspired in several instances to write additional sentences and paragraphs to the earlier revelations. In this manner, the Lord did truly give line upon line, here a little and there a little, the same as he did to a revelation that Jeremiah received. In a church conference in early 1832, Joseph Smith appointed Oliver Cowdery, W.W. Phelps, and John Whitmer to review Joseph Smith's revelations again and select for printing such as, he sh such as shall be deemed by them proper as dictated by the spirit and make all necessary verbal corrections. The three men drew from two collections of manuscripts, written copies of Revelation that Oliver Cowdery and John Whitmer carried to Independence, Missouri in January, 1832, and written copies of Revelations that Joseph Smith himself brought around the same time the conference convened. Beginning in 1832, the newspaper Evening and Morning Star published at least one revelation in each issue for over a year. Chronological dates, rather than theme or nar narrative arc, largely structure the Doctrine and Covenants. Without an overarching narrative, its organization differs significantly from the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the Book of Mormon. A central theme and unifying concept for the Doctrine and Covenants is, however, Revelation. With respect to sections three through nine, today's reading assignment, the current version of the Doctrine and Covenants mirrors chapters two through eight of the 1833 Book of Commandments. Chapter one and section one are also the same. Section two, dated 1823, was one of those sections added by Orson Pratt in 1876 under the direction of Brigham Young. Orson Pratt added those 26 revelations to the 1876 edition but he did not add the first vision, even though the Pearl of Great Price would not be accepted as scripture until four years later in 1880. In 1981 and 2013, the church revised the footnotes and updated the introductory notes for each section of the Doctrine and Covenants. For readers, some five to seven generations removed from the events and peoples of Joseph Smith's revelations, the headnotes provide useful information and context. The headnotes are not, however, neutral. They frame the reader's experience with the text and set expectations about its content from a particular point of view. Each headnote for sections three through nine begins with the words, revelation given through or to Joseph Smith, the prophet. The headnotes for sections three and six identify Urim and Thummim as the physical mechanism through which the revelation occurred. The other section head notes are silent as to the revelatory process or mechanism, although several seem to have come at the request of the individual to whom they are directed. Joseph Smith, his father, Martin Harris, Oliver Cowdery. Identifying Urim and Thummim as the physical mechanism by which Joseph Smith received revelation provides another model for the revelatory process, one apparently quite distinct from the reading and prayer model 
of the First Division. In retrospect, several of Joseph Smith's contemporaries describe other re revelatory models. Harley P. Pratt described Joseph Smith's receipt of what is now section 50 of the Doctrine and Covenants and then generalized the description. He said, after we had joined in prayer, he dictated in our presence the following revelation. Each sentence was uttered slowly and very distinctly and with a pause between each sufficiently long for it to be recorded by an ordinary writer in longhand. This was the manner in which all his revelations were dictated and written. As he dictated them, so they stood. Wilfred Woodruff described Joseph Smith as full of revelation. He could translate anything given to him of God. He could receive revelation without the Urim and Thummim. The revelations were given to him by the inspiration of Almighty God. Orson Pratt also observed, Joseph Smith received the ideas from God, but clothed those ideas with such words as came to his mind. The head note for section seven identifies an additional revelatory process, one more similar to Joseph Smith's translation of the Book of Mormon than to the first vision template or the descriptions of other contemporary observers. Section seven is a translated version of the record made on parchment by John and hidden up by himself. Did John deliver the manuscript to Joseph Smith? Did Joseph Smith discover the parchment as he did the golden plates? Sections around seven also deal with translation of the Book of Mormon and who was empowered to do it. Perhaps the ascendancy of the first vision as the origin story of the restoration in the 20th century church, or at least in my experience of the 20th century church, can be explained in part by its accessibility. It's template for revelation available to all as James 1, 5 offers. In contrast, the modes of revelation identified in sections three through nine desired by Oliver Cowdery and Martin Harris, or remembered by Orson Pratt, Parley Pratt, and Wilfred Woodruff, Urim and Thummim, translation of the Golden Plates, receipt and translation of an ancient parchment written by John, dictation, God's ideas clothed with mortal words. Perhaps those are prophetic, not personal. Those modes of revelation belonging to Joseph Smith, the prophet. The lesson of William McClellan's hubris and humil humiliation remains clear, as does the power shift between Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery. Sections six and seven are directed to both Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery. In sections eight and nine, the revelations are through Joseph Smith, the prophet, to Oliver Cowdery. As my final point, I want to contrast the publicity surrounding so many of Joseph Smith's revelations their dissemination orally in written manuscripts, um, their dissemination orally in written manuscripts, in circulation of those manuscripts, print publication, newspapers like the Evening and Morning Times and the Times and Season, compilation into the Book of Commandments and Doctrine and Covenants and missionary pamphlets with the secrecy associated with plural marriage. Again, in this lesson, I'm not interested in evaluating the truth claims or truth value of any of them. Rather, I see the differing strategies of publicity and secrecy mutually reinforcing a trajectory of patriarchy and homosociality. The dominant form of creation I see in the Doctrine and Covenants, both in its text and its compilation, is patriarchal and homosocial. In its text, the Doctrine and Covenants identifies only two women, Emma Smith and Vienna Jacques by name. Collective references to women and only women are also rare. No individual women exist in today's assigned readings of sections three through nine. The sections are received through Joseph Smith and directed to individual men. Of course, God's initial call in the first verse of the first section of Doctrine and Covenants is gender neutral. Hearken, O you people of my church, saith the voice of him who dwells on high and whose eyes are upon all men. Yea, verily I say, hearken ye people from afar. Likewise, the term men used as a collective noun could include women in 19th century English parlance, while women did not include men. That the term men could include women, however, does not mean that all references to men in the Doctrine and Covenants apply to women. Women of the church today well know not to liken unto us the Doctrine and Covenants gendered role division within church structures. 
nor does the linguistic possibility of women's inclusion mean that they were included in fact. The contingent and emergent form the Doctrine and Covenants took over time depended on the sociality and decisions of men. Joseph Smith, Oliver Cowdery, W.W. Phelps, John Whitmer, Brigham Young, Orson Pratt, Thomas B. Marsh, David Patton, Heber C. Kimball, Orson Hyde, William McClellan, Parley B. Pratt, Luke Johnson, William Smith, John Boynton, Lyman Johnson. The process of printing and publishing Joseph Smith's revelations both reveals and reinforces homosociality. With respect to the functional uses and power of secrecy, I draw on Timothy Garton Ashe's The File, A Personal History, Catherine Verdery's Secrets and Truths, Ethnography in the Archive of Romania's Secret Police, and the first chapter of Gilbert Hurd's book, Secrecy and Cultural, Re Cultural Reality, Utopian Ideologies of the New Guinea's, New Guinea Men's House. That chapter, that first chapter is entitled, Lewis Henry Morgan and Victorian Secret Societies. Both Garton, Ash, and Verdery deal with the effects opening secret police archives in forming former communist countries had on society. And the authors used their own files as touchstones. Garton Ash presents East Germany, where he lived in 1978 and visited frequently as a journalist. Verdery analyzes Romania, where she conducted the research for her PhD dissertation in the 1980s. Verdery's Secrets and Truths is an ethnography of the archives of the communist era Roma Romanian secret police, the Securitate. As an anthropologist, Verdery repeatedly emphasizes, as I hope I have done here, that she is not examining the truth claims or truth value of the Securitate archives. Rather, she focuses on the function, forms, and the power of secrecy. At one point, she references work by Gilbert Hurd on men's secret societies in upstate New York in the 19th century. I know, it all seems like a stretch, right? East German and Romanian secret police in the 20th century, secret societies in New Guinea, secret societies in New York in the 19th century, Latter-day Saints in the 19th, 20th and 21st, but, but stick with me on this one. Verdery reads Hurt as, as follows. Rebecca. Hurt does not rest with New Guinea, however, but extends his argument to 19th century upstate New York, where a young Louis, Louis Henry Morgan, um, who lived from 1818 to 1881, was an early anthropologist, social theorist, and lawyer, was deeply involved with secret societies. It was a time when many new secret societies were forming, often adopting a kinship idiom. Their members had to pledge loyalty through adoption degree to fictive brothers and fathers, creating male camaraderie by hiding their rituals of solidarity from women. In Hertz's view, these secret societies offered a solution to problems of a specific moment in class and gender transformation in the United States, which produced a crisis of masculinity. They developed new forms of collective male secrecy, which recognized men's relations of trust and hierarchy in those uncertain times. And in Hertz's own words, in his book's preface, he states, in this book, I have proposed a general theory of the conditions that foster secrecy, especially among men, who in dealing with social anxiety and mistrust, deploy rituals of conditional masculinity to gain purpose and agency, achieve homosociality and trust, imposing hierarchy and rule over younger males and women. The personal and institutional outcome is to create an alternative hidden cultural reality in society. I see the secrecy associated with Joseph Smith's revelations and practice of plural marriage creating an alternative hidden cultural reality that reinforced the public facing homosociality and patriarchy already evident in the organization of the church and in the contingent choices surrounding the printing, publication and contents of the doctrine and covenants. In conclusion, I seek an alternative trajectory that more fully recognizes, includes, and empowers women. I echo and ache with Laurel Thatcher Ulrich's devastating confrontation 
of sexism in Alma 13 through 16 in her dialogue Sunday gospel study on June 21st of last year. I wish for new life for the dead ended trajectories of Amy Brown Lyman and Franklin S. Harris. I imagine given our professional connections, deep conversation and productive debate with J. Ruben Clark, despite our differences. And now in the normal science mode of 20th century Latter-day Saint Sunday school lessons, Sunday um, talks, and with its truth value in my heart, I end with Doctrine and Covenants section nine, verse seven. I hope I have understood that I have not supposed that God would give it to me, give it unto me, when I took no thought but to ask, that I have instead studied it out in my own mind and then asked if it be right. Thanks. Thank you. Do we have, uh, do we have time for some discussion? Thumbs up there. We have no um, time limits. We have no time limits. Are you up for it, Kiff? Yes, yes. Um, I wanted to add one uh, comment because I found the word homosociality um, potentially confusing. And so I looked it up. Um, I, it's not been in my common vocabulary. It is a, uh, it means a same-sex relationships or same-sex relationships that are not of a romantic or sexual nature, such as a friendship, mentorship, or others. Um, in our, I, I guess that's, uh, you used it a number of times and it seems to fit the, especially the 19th century uh, development of the both secret and um, public revelations. I yeah, think that's- and I would argue that in um, we live in a very homosocial world today within the church that um, cross uh, gender friendships are not the the dominant mode of, of sociality. And by sociality, I just mean getting together and being with people, any sorts of any sorts of relationships that that. Um, Men um, are friends with men and women are friends with women um, much more commonly uh, than across, across gender. And I, I don't know what was ever said to in Relief Society, but I, I know that the way I was taught about why priesthood, why priesthood meeting, why, why priesthood quorums was exactly that. That uh, that was the place where we would have the real social sociability that we would come to know each other and uh, and uh, it fits that pattern exactly. And the way I was taught, the way I grew up. I, do we have questions from the chat? Or? We we do. So here's here's a question. I agree that we still socialize by gender, but I wonder if men socialize and support each other as much as women do in the church. Um, Sylvia says, but everyone knows Relief Society is more fun. Sylvia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, yeah. that may in fact have been something that we have tried to create in the church through quorums, um, th that the sorts of intense friendships um, that may have characterized the 19th century, I, I don't know, um, for, for men are, are less frequent and less opportunity, uh, are, are more difficult for whatever reasons um, in, the, in the 20th and the 21st century. Well, I, I wonder. So, can we take? Uh, uh, I, I'm just. Uh, this has got me thinking. I wonder if um, the kind of homosocial relations between women in the church are less hierarchical and less kind of. Is there something about that 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 kind of opens it up, whereas um, relationships between men sometimes are um, because they're at least in the past have been 
you know, different positions that you hold in the priesthood that are related to um, adult male quorums and and kind of status. I don't I don't know. It's just got me thinking a little bit. Yeah, I I was going to take another direction, but yeah, I um, but we have a request here <laughs> that we um, really ask this question, which is if uh, if homosociality is is the trajectory of the church uh, as a pattern both in the 19th and 20th century. Um, why then such a taboo for um, homosexual relationships? Yeah. You want to take that uh, or not? No. <laughs> I, I don't have, um, I don't have a, uh, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I think that uh, you can look at some of Michael Quinn's work on homosociality in the in the early church for uh, a really interesting take on homosociality, at least. Uh, in in the Fuller book, uh, Gilbert Hurd's Secrecy and Cultural Reality, Utopian Ideologies of the New Guinea Men's House, um, he, he ties it into um, sexuality as well. Um, and, and when you look at uh, the practice of plural marriage, um, it wasn't homosexuality, but it was definitely tied around uh, sexuality uh, of, and, and what the constraints of that, of that would be and, and sexual license for men um, in contravention of the sexual mores of, of, of the time. Um, um, could I go back to the, the scripture, uh, the idea of the Doctrine and Covenants being um, contingent, being a construction? Yeah. Um, the, uh, as you point out, it is all men, um, all men with a purpose making selection and editing and revising and, and putting in and taking out. Um, if you, um, first of all, I, uh, just a comment that it seems to me that the, that the uh, Joseph Smith Papers Project has made that um, clearer than ever, almost a necessary question that we have to ask. How did, how did this all come to be as we see so much more than, um, I mean, I frankly grew up with the idea that the Doctrine and Covenants was the collection of the things Joseph Smith said, and that that was pretty much the, the, his work. That was the, the volume of work. And I, no one ever said that in so many words, but that's certainly the impression I had. Uh, nowadays, the idea that there was a selection process, that there was a decision-making, and that it was all men doing that with a purpose is, uh, is almost inescapable. Um, and then the question, what do you do about it? Um, what, where, where are you going with that? What, what, what can you do about that now? Um, you want a new trajectory. And, and how, do you, how do you personally, Tiff, how do you get there? Um, how can we get there? Well, I think that, um including women starting now would be great. But I also think that there are ways of thinking about things that Joseph Smith said and did if we're still focused in specifically on Joseph Smith's revelations, which in large part the, um, the Doctrine and Covenants is, although I wanna talk about um, you know, the additions in official declaration one and official declaration two in particular, that, that we can look back to Joseph Smith and things that he did and said that perhaps the Joseph Smith papers have, have provided to us um, and, and draw those in, see those as possibilities for inclusion in canonized scripture as opposed to um, other, um, other forms of publication. I mean, we, the, the quote from Orson, Orson Pratt was, he didn't, Joseph Smith thought it was fine to leave some of the things for publication in his history. And he didn't really care about the chronological order. Um, 
well, what is there in the Joseph Smith history that might is more inclusive? Or let's go to the endowment ceremony. I think that one of the real differences between um, sort of the secrecy model that um, the anthropologists that I was talking about um, present and um, at least some of the visions of early temple practice was that it did include, it did include women. And um, it was less gendered in the sense that women were baptized for men and by proxy for men. And, uh, and, and so the, 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 the corporal identification um, across, you know, living and dead wasn't as strict um, as it is as it is now. And so that, that initial inclusion of women um, is, a, is a bright spot. But, but then let's also look, uh, well, okay, I know there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot there. <laughs> so, so although the inclusion of women is on very different terms because it's um, about polygamy, right? And uh, one of the attendees has brought up, um, you know, that, that kind of a, that idea, um, you know, women are included in the secret society with polygamy, but it's on yeah. very different terms and, and many of the women who are actually included and affected are not in on the secrets <laughs> at all times. Anyway, yeah. it, it's it's highly it's highly problematic. Yes. Um, so so if if we can't find within the history even those strands, then then let's go with our commitment to continuing revelation. That's what I mean. The doctrine and covenants as we've constructed it now. Yes, it's largely. Joseph Smith, but it's also Joseph F. Smith, and it's um, and it's Wilford Woodruff, of official declaration one, but most most profoundly, it's official declaration two. It's not included as a as a section of the Doctrine and Covenants, but that is um, and and the mode of revelation. Like, the mode of revelation there is prayer inquiry, and we have a really detailed description of the process that Spencer W. Kimball went through to, um, to obtain that revelation. Um, so let's, let's be a church of continuing, of continuing revelation of, as the introduction to the Doctrine and Covenants says, you know, now that we, um, we have developments and we have and we have changes and we, and we recognize those. Um, and, and that the social cultural context in which we la live now is distinct from that of, of, Joseph Smith, of Joseph Smith's time. And so it, it, it allows us to ask other questions or at least we, we can ask other questions about what's contained in the Doctrine and Covenants. What is revelation and what is what is scripture? Um, so uh, there's a comment that uh, to bring in here that uh, LDS women have have been exploring alternative constructions since uh, the 1980s, if not earlier, citing in particular Margaret Toscano's "The Forgotten Role of Queens and Priestesses" as well, as one well, one add, example. And and if we're talking about kind of alternative trajectories, I mean the the first woman's exponent. Right, those are LDS women exploring uh, the the meaning <laughs> of the gospel and um, theolog theologizing um, and and living it in very and it in different constructs. Yeah. Now, Kif, you would would you you suggested in the way you divided your comments, talking about the construction of the Doctrine and Covenants, and then separately about secret societies. Um, would it's 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 one avenue, one track to talk about adding on um, more of what was um, in in the Joseph Smith papers, more that might have been in the history. It's a, a different track to talk about the secret parts. And would you treat those differently? Would you would you take a adding on for the public and uh, second guessing on the private? Uh, uh, well, I, I think I would respond, well, 
if you look at the the change when 1876 happens and Orson Pratt changes un, under the direction of Brigham Young, right? I mean, it's under the direction of the prophet at the time. Um, but they replace, you know, they take, they add what is one section 132, but they remove whatever was in the 1835 commandments about marriage because they are inconsistent. And um, so that, that previous secret something is now in, in coded language, of course, included officially in the, um, in the publication. Um, and, and it changes what the fundamental theology is. And I think it's a fascinating that, um, you know, J. Ruben Clark is enforcing a sexual monogamy, you know, sexual orthodoxy of monogamy in 1845 against Amy Brown Lyman's husband, who, you know, is, uh, I mean, J. Ruben Clark is terrible. He, he essentially does a sting on, on Richard Lyman and discovers, you know, that he is in fact in a sexual relationship with another woman and whether or not it was just adultery or whether or not it was post manifesto polygamy unauthorized, you know, it's hard to, um, to uh, figure out, but that, that, that shift in orthodoxy from, poly from monogamy to polygamy back to monogamy, um, that, that, you know, that, that's fascinating fascinating to me. I mean, it's also deeply, deeply painful that Amy Brown Lyman resigns as president of the Relief Society because of the sexual misconduct of, of her husband, feels like she has to. And so it's once again women who are suffering for um, the actions, the actions of, of, of men. With respect to secrecy, I mean, I, I thought it was really interesting uh, the last, uh, uh, the, the church has now published the covenants in the, in the handbook, I think it is, published, made public the covenants that people make in the temple. And I think that, that some of that, or at least some of those covenants, and, and that was a real pushback against people feeling like they had, they had no idea or they didn't know specifically what they were, what they were covenanting to before they went to the, to the temple. Uh, and so that's a move towards openness that, um, that I wouldn't have expected in the past, particularly because I went uh, through the temple for the first time in the 1980s, uh, mid 1980s uh, with a very different, um, <laughs> very, different, very different experience. Very different experience. Let's, uh, a very um, different experience. Yeah, there's a, there's a there's a comment here that may tie together a couple of things. That that uh, going back to the con to the question about the homosociability or homosociality and and sexuality, and the the comment is that it's um, fairly common to see a. Uh, a society that has a homosociality uh, element to also have to police carefully the sexuality. And um, it occurs to me that, that also you can run that all the way through. If you have a society that has, as, as the 19th century and 20th century LDS society does, very clear um, male and female um, social sociability social groups and um and polygamy and j Ruben clark's policing of the move away from polygamy you end up with a society that needs to have very strong policing of sexual behavior and i i I, I'm looking to you to nod, I guess, or to say something about that. Yeah. I um, think, I think I, it, it, those pieces well, come together. It's interesting that you characterize it as needing yeah. to police <laughs> sexuality, as if the other structures created that need to police sexuality instead of perhaps 
the other the other way around that the need to police sexuality um, but still allow people to have any sort of relationship um, create some of the other create some of the other structures and, and I also see secrecy as power but on the flip side secrecy can also be shame um, and so it's there are different different deployments of secrecy to either um, it sort of um, consolidate power, create hierarchies of, of relationships um, with power on one end and shame and shame on on the other. Um, but we do we do the 21st century church is remains a high policer of <laughs> of sexuality, homosexuality, heterosexuality um, in, in really significant ways. So I'm thinking yeah. more about your setting up the kind of accessibility and inclusivity of the first vision narrative founding of the restoration um, versus what we get in the Doctrine and Covenants, which is a lot of um, kind of, you know, uh, revelation coming through Joseph Smith to particular people, um, it being about kind of access to special gifts, um, maybe sometimes using the Urim and th Thummim. Um, and, and, you know, thinking about these chapters three through nine, there's like, it's all about, there's tons of like, secret knowledge like you'll have you'll get access to this um unless you're not like faithful or ready or obe being obedient <laughs> enough to my commandments um anyway i'm just struck by the by the kind of you know access to revelation again um requiring a mediator and and um you know you've got to be part of the you know connected to the prophet versus the message of the, of the first vision and God's revelation wisdom is available to all. Yeah, but, but you do with the first vision, you do have to translate Joseph Smith's question. It can't be in, in the modern structure of the church, right? It can't be which church should I join? because that question has already been answered. And if you are asking that question um, and you're already a member of the church, that's, that's a problem in, in the structure of revelation and the church and, and the restoration. You have to ask Joseph Smith's question in a different, in a different way. And, you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not convinced that, his initial question was in fact, especially if you go back and read the summer 1832 document, that his question at its core was what church should I join as opposed to um, how, do, how, do I, how do I be a good person? I mean, if you read that 1832 version, he, he says, and my sins were forgiven me. Um, how, do, how do I bring my life into harmony? with God. The specific articulation over the course of time may have become which church should I join, but I think that, or at least I, I, I interpret um, his question as a, a very fundamental one that many, many people have, which is, how do I be good? And maybe yeah. that's too ecumenical, maybe that's too uh, alternative trajectory, but. No, no, I love this um, focus on the questions that get asked and that don't get asked and, or that aren't kind of designed to be asked. Um, yeah, I like that. And I'm, and I'm thinking yeah. too about one of the chapters in this section of reading deals with like, is that Oliver and Joseph Smith, like they have a question that they get revelation on about like, was John like, John the beloved, did he, um, is yeah. he still on the earth, <laughs> right? right. And, and I was so struck in reading that, like, 
like this is the question they're going to God about. <laughs> and that is not, you know, the kind of question that I would be wondering about if I'm going to have um, kind of miraculous things, uh, you know, revealed to me through the spirit and through access to God. Um, you know, that's not going to be my question. Um, and I, and I think that kind of example, um, yeah, kind of helps to bring out these alternative trajectories and what is cut off and what, yeah. Should, uh, it's should, interesting. We have the, should we have the closing prayer and then continue our chat? And then, um, yes, let's do that. It's, uh, it's just, it's after 11 um, Utah time. I think that's, uh, I'm not gonna try that, for a wrap up I, question. Go before ahead. we do that, can I just say, as I was thinking about your lesson, I was also thinking as we all have been, um, Amanda Gorman's beautiful poem and, um, and I just see lots of echoes in, in this lesson to what some of her messages, kind of the, the loss we carry, um, the grieving, but the growing, um, the hurt, but the hope, um, and uh, the idea of, um, you know, coming into something that is better than what we were left with and stepping out of the shade. Anyway, um, this kind of idea about alternative uh, trajectories and what we can be moving forward. Well, thank you. I, uh, let's wrap with, uh, I, although I'm bubbling with questions and they're- Well, I'm, 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 happy, to, so I'm we'll, happy to stay on. I just- we'll, we'll come back. We'll come back. We'll be here. Um, but let's, uh, let's, as a way to um, close this session in a formal way, uh, we'd, we'd ask Christina Bilikoff to offer a closing prayer. Uh, Christina is with us. She graduated from BYU Law School in 2011. She's a survivor of California's devastating campfire in 2018, and now a caregiver to her sister's three young children uh, and, a, and an aspiring writer. Look forward to hearing more from Christina, but Christina, your, um, your voice. Oh God, we give thanks for the words that have been spoken here today. We give thanks for our forefathers and foremothers, the branches in our sprawling family tree who brought us to this moment. We honor those who in times of trouble cast their, eye, their eyes upwards, took their bearings by the twinkling patterns in the night sky and chartered their course to the present moment. We give thanks for those who have given us the words with which we navigate our own uncertain seas. But let us not only remember our ancestors to whom we owe our lives, let us also remember the broken branches and the barren ground and all those who would never be our mothers or our fathers, but who remain our brothers and sisters still. Let us remember the heartbroken women and the disappointed men who returned to their God with empty arms, who cut roads that were never followed, who told stories that would never be repeated and who sung lullabies to children who were not their own. Let us remember both the fruitful boughs and the broken branches belong to one single tree, and that all good fruit is a gift from God. Amen. Thank you, Christina. That was yep. beautiful. Christina, amen. And um, bye.